All right. Hello, Next Op Social family. Welcome to another live chat discussion here on our YouTube channel. Uh, I am Richelle Wright Wilson, as always. I'm joined by Juwan Buford. And today we're joined by branding marketing media expert uh, Danko Sadarsky, who is currently the head of brand for Very United and more locally, Very Detroit. So before we jump into it, if you're watching us with us here, please make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss an interview, never miss a live, never miss out on these discussions that we're having here at Next Op Social. Now that that's done, we can get into it. Welcome, Danko. Thank you again for joining us here today. Um, we're so excited to have you and talking about media and marketing and branding and all that goodness in between. Um, so tell us a little more about yourself, your background and because we are here to focus on entrepreneurship, what caused you to fall in love with becoming an entrepreneur? Oh, I, I, it's funny because um, I don't know if it's a choice. A lot of times it's more or less how you're brought up and it's almost like internal. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Danko Sudorowski. I'm the head of brand for Very United Brands and we uh, operate and started Very Detroit uh, um, October 18th, uh, no, October 19th, 2018. So we began broadcasting and started to talk about local media, um, talking with local folks. And a big piece of what I felt like we were doing was trying to start um, exposing the real local people that we just don't get the exposure. And one of the things that we saw that was small business and uh, not and nonprofits just don't have the exposure. So the problem we approached was that small business and nonprofits are priced out and not part of the new media market. Mm -hmm. So we tried to figure out a product that could really expose all the great work nonprofits do in our city that don't get acknowledged, that are doing the work, the leg work around the city. And those are, those are, the, those are the interviews we like to start with. And local um, artists that are creating change through their work and also social entrepreneurs that are changing how we look at the way we do business. So that's kind of like is a summary of how we began our show um, and why we began our show. So, Danko, you know, doing a little bit of a dive, right? And of course, previous conversations we have we've had together, you have quite a bit of experience in the marketing industry, right? And let's be transparent, with your pedigree and background, you could have chose a lot of different cushy jobs, right? You could have walked into corporate America, done the whole salaried employee thing um and you chose to go a different route and you said something to start the webcast and that was that it wasn't necessarily a choice right um and when i hear that my ears perk up then i i start thinking about necessity right and we know a lot of entrepreneurial endeavors are born out of necessity if you don't mind elaborate a little bit on that when you say entrepreneurship wasn't a choice for you um talk about that a little bit to me, uh, we, we kind of get stuck in roles a lot of times where we feel like we're doing positive work. Mm -hmm. um, and as we get older, I feel you get closer and closer to what you, you truly want to accomplish. And the closer you get to that, that truth, I feel um, it creates that direction for entrepreneurialism. Um, because you're not going to find a job that fits those particulars a lot of times, mm -hmm. like you said, right? Well, I was VP of marketing for a, a variety of uh, manufacturing companies, distribution companies, but it just didn't really challenge where I wanted to go. And I felt like we could, we could offer something that's not in the marketplace, help people, um, and you're right, not really profit instantly from it, 
but I think contribute to the, the better good. And and I don't think a lot of times entrepreneurs, when they are are taking up a challenge like this, mm. it's more part like like Mother Teresa. I don't want to compare myself to Mother Teresa, but Mother Teresa, she didn't go to the nicest place in India. She went to the worst place in India. She went to Calcutta, so she could help people there. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Detroit has got the best and some of the worst stuff that we could be affected by. So mm -hmm. um, I, want, I, w I was raised in Hamtramck and our, our view of the world when I was growing up was a diverse Detroit. And it was a great place to live. We had a lot of foreigners, a lot of African-Americans in my school and we had a great mix. And somehow or another, I feel like it kind of went away a little bit. Mm. And I, and coming back to where we are today, uh, we don't necessarily sometimes have that choice. You just see that this is something we need to do. I got you. And we just push that direction. I hope that I like answers it. your question. No, it was fantastic, man. Uh, fantastic. Um, a lot of times people, you think about entrepreneurship, it's oftentimes focused on a personal need, right? And right. No, no criticism for that. You know, we know a lot of entrepreneurial ventures are born out of financial necessity, right? right? But you're talking more of a mission orientation. Um, and, and that's exciting, right? Because like you said before, your business wasn't born out of greed, but actually a real desire to meet a need in the community. Um, right. And one of the things that really impressed me, uh, the first time, well, I'd done, a, of course, a little bit of a deep dive before I participated in your radio show the first time, but having participated and then hadn't been a chance to listen to it repeatedly, I was really shocked by the diversity of that show. I was right. really blown away. I was shocked by the diversity of talent that um, the team that you have around you. I was shocked by the diversity of the subject matter and topics you all covered. That really impressed me. And I think it's unique and one of a kind. Danko, Thank you. that's Thank not you easy. That. To, you're welcome. That's not easy to pull off though. Because when you have diversity, that means you also have divergent ideals. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you right. have divergent world views. You have divergent everything. Right. Um, and of course, diversity is a new trendy thing, right? Um, so yeah. listening to you, you're not just talking about it from a, a smooth little marketing or promotional ploy. Diversity is what you live. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's your work. What? It's, it's our mantra. I mean, it's if we look at what we started to talk about was, well, firstly, let me step back for a minute. Um, in Detroit, 2016, 2017, what you, what you saw and what you heard was just everything that Gilbert was doing. And I'm like, mm -hmm. this is not Detroit. We have this huge complex community that is disconnected, mm. right? It's complex, it's disconnected, and the only topic isn't quick and loans, right? We have such complex needs, complex services, complex people. And, and I kind of went off on that tangent to talk about everything else not quick in, yeah. right? If that makes any sense. So yeah. that media that we, were being pushed was all about that stuff, right? We want to cover the stuff like we just had an author on last uh, last week on our show. Um, Black Bottom Bread is his is his book. Um, mm -hmm. He was he he suffered through some bad years growing up in parts of Detroit, but he came out of it. And those are the stories we like to talk about. He's now written twelve books. He's a publisher, has a publishing business. And those are, those are the things that excite me to see people 
somehow changing their lives around and helping others. Mm. It's like him writing that book helped himself, but is also now helping others with his experience. Yeah. And, it's, um, and that's the beauty of Detroit. You know, what was funny. Uh, you go to other cities and they don't get how we hustle, right? Like we're always trying to make things happen, right? Yeah. Detroiters are a unique breed. And I think that's what we're trying to capture is that we're, we're so unique in our music. We're so unique in our culture. There's no other city like us, right? And that's what we're trying to share, the positive things that Detroit's all about. Um, those, those things you don't see on the nice TV channels and everything else, right? Mm -hmm. They're not gonna go to the places we go and they're not gonna have the people we have on our show. Um, and that's what makes us unique. But we feel like inclu inclusivity is really something that we try and thrive to accomplish, right? Um, and, and most of the shows don't, aren't really there. I think we've been lucky to have so many participants in our show and, and been accepted like we have. It's been just an honor to talk with all these folks that we have talked to. It's been great. Really have, you included. I accept that. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, one of the biggest challenges as an entrepreneur you can have, particularly when you have a mission orientation, right? Um, or I think what people would oftentimes refer to as social entrepreneurship, right? Yes. Is you have the mission of serving others, you have the mission of meeting the need, but let's be real, there's also the monetary side of it, right? Right. <laughs> and you have to find a way to monetize what you're doing. Yes. Because um, at the end of the day, if you're not monetizing what you're doing, if you're not scaling, if you're not generating revenues, right. you can't serve the mission on a broader level, right? Correct. And uh, have yeah. So talk to us a little bit about that transition and what some of those challenges have been and how you've begun to kind of overcome them. Uh, great question. And... Most, most times I think that when we embark on a mission like this, you don't really figure out the model right up front, right? You, mm -hmm. We just started doing it and believed that this is the way, right? We believe in this formula. We believe that we're doing the right thing. We're connecting the right people and we've got good technology and the money will come as long as we're helping and doing the right things. And so that's proved itself, but it didn't happen right away because as you know, many people are skeptical of like, what are you really all about, right? Yep. And what are you trying to do with me, right? When I interview you or when we interview folks, um, I think we want a platform that can, we can share our ideas in a, in a way that's not offensive to anyone and to try to get the best out of our community and give for our community. So over time, that starts to uh, give you a social currency. And we were lucky enough to start to figure out a business model around our product, our conversation, and our timing right now in the marketplace. Mm. And so, like, you could have ideas come at you and you can embark on missions, but sometimes the timing or the people or the, or the situation just doesn't fit. We feel like everything has been on target for us, maybe not as fast as we wanted, obviously, to, to start the cash flow, but the mission has really carried our, 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 our business. And, and like, you know, you're pulling money to fund your belief, right? It's an investment into your family's future. So many times people will pull out before they realize cash flow or profit. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of resources out there that can help great entrepreneurs reach cash flow 
with maybe some uh, bridge loans or some other types of financial instruments to help them get to that next spot. But as you know, right, it comes down to sales, connections, networks, understanding what you're offering, your value proposition, and what is it worth. And when you really dissect your project and your program down, uh, you need to go that, that deep to understand how and when you will cash flow. Mm -hmm. And you're more of an expert on that than me um, when it comes to the financials and things like that. But it, that drive to cash flow and to um, efficiency is what, you know, we want to help others, other entrepreneurs do that as well. And so we're trying to offer that medium to introduce and to try to help others cash flow too. Yes. For instance, um, one of our, the cover of our, of our mobile magazine for Barry Detroit has artwork on it, right? And mm -hmm. so um, this is a local artist that we're working with to try to promote. So they came on our show um, and then we have tried to uh, advertise them in as many places that we could and talk about them. Mm -hmm. So art's a big thing that I think frees our mind um, to, to be creative and to help others through that message. So we try to promote artists and connect them into our uh, program. I love it. What's the artist's name offhand? Anthony Brass. I like it. Yeah, Anthony Brass. Um, you know, we met at an art gallery show. He's done multiple different art gallery pieces and um and he's been growing ever since we've talked to him and started and it's great right to see that now he's traveling he's in more shows he's doing more work he's been commissioned it's been great and that's one artist and then um other nonprofits that we have uh loved to help is uh, one is gloria's refuge they help uh underprivileged women that come out of incarceration find places to stay mm. so we've tried to promote their their mission and try to connect them to people that can help with that mission nice. there's so many little minor middle little missions all around the city right and if we could just help a couple a day that'd be great yeah um thank you you touched on a few different ways to dive into a little bit on the different ways that you're executing that mission. I know you have the radio show, you said you have the magazine, um, the different ways that you um, are executing this mission and why, why did you choose to do it this way? Well, growing up in Hamtramck, and coming to America as a young child, we were always looking at how to save money, how not to spend money. Um, and there was always a fabric of culture and community. And growing up in Detroit was a gift. And when, if you were able to grow up in Detroit in its, in its time, uh, it was there was a lot of wonder all out all through Detroit and so many different types of people interconnecting working together playing together and I think over the years our the racial divide and everything spread us further and further from our true selves mm -hmm. and so I wanted to make something that we could efficiently distribute at a low cost and help as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. So that led us to make, instead of a full size magazine, a um, one carded magazine where you can access through a scan. And this is pre COVID almost two years, right? Yeah. Um, that we came up with this concept. So, it's much more efficient to produce one of these than a, a, a magazine you would look at. Mm 
Mm -hmm. That was one of our things was efficiency. Is like, how are we going to scale if our costs are really high? And we were able to identify our technology that's going to be the lowest, lowest cost. And uh, our, the magazine distribution, there is no easier or cheaper way to get that accomplished. And then the way we distribute our, our media through our social channels, but also through the broadcast of AM. AM and its coverage range is usually a little bit bigger and less expensive to broadcast through. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've broadcast through AM and FM. Um, and I, AM seems to work for us. It has a larger coverage app and it's less expensive. And then what we do is we convert our broadcast into a podcast after. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to do that pretty efficiently. Thereby, we can start to cash flow much quicker than if we had a lot of costs every month. Yeah. We don't have high costs. And that comes, I believe, from growing up in Hamtramck and in Detroit and trying to really um, what we all do in Detroit is try to try to make something better, quicker, faster, more efficient. That's what we do. You know, we just hustle a little more than other cities. And we try to come up with ideas that are going to make a difference. I do believe we do need stronger resources to help our entrepreneurs in our city. I know that we've made some good strides, like some of the co-working spaces and other places, but I think we need to do more work still mm -hmm. to help, especially social entrepreneurs all around the country, but specifically Detroit. And there are some, there are some different places to get help, but there's always room for more. Yeah, absolutely. So Danko, you know, entrepreneurship is never linear. It's never a straight line, right? You go backwards, forwards, sideways, successes, failures, ups and downs. You have to learn to discipline your disappointments, right? Um, yeah. As you are making the climb. Um, what are some of the disappointments you've had to discipline along your journey? I know there have been plenty. Yes. Um, but what are some ones that really stick out where you're like, you know what? Um, I wish I learned this lesson sooner, but I'm glad I did now. Right. Um, right. 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 Talk to and, us a little bit about that. You know, I think our, ourselves in our mind, right. Are, can play tricks on us. Right. And sometimes deceive our mission. So, we can stumble upon things, but really trying to stay clear in your mind. So I want to just step back, whatever that may be that we come across. What I've tried to do is, is stay close to my true self. And I've done that through meditation and yoga and, and, and just stepping back so that I could really know what I'm working with because it's easy to be angry, right? It's easy to blame others, right? It's easy to say, uh, they don't like me because I'm a white guy, right? You can say all kinds of things. And I feel like as long as you stay true to who you are, no one can take anything from you. And whatever those bumps or hurdles may be, you know, like starting this new media company, Juan, right? You can imagine all of the different, well, who are you? What are you? What, why are you doing this? What's your gain out of this? I'm just answering those questions. So it took us almost six months to just, oh, not almost six months, but I would say to define who we really are to the public right it takes time to be like no he's not really that guy or is he that guy right so people question your intentions mm -hmm. 
And over time, I think they learn who you are. And you need patience as an entrepreneur because you're going to hit all kinds of, of hurdles with money, with access, with connections, with people just wanting to block your progress, right? And if you're a social entrepreneur, you try to figure out your cash flow because your mission is so critical to your heart that you'll find the money to get the get you to the next place. But um, don't give up your mission. I don't know if I answered your question, but I wanted to get that out, Joanna. Um, and I guess one of um, one of the biggest hurdles, I guess, would be cash flow, right? Um, paying every week to be on media when you don't have sponsors to pay um, and they don't believe in you yet, and you're just trying to figure out how to get to the next week, the next show, right? And that's your focus. And as long as you stay small and humble, you get to those places. And people might not call you back when you're asking them, but they may still want to do the work with you. So a lot of times entrepreneurs and people will, will stumble on, well, he didn't call me back. He's not interested. My project's no good. I'm not really sure. And um, those are parts and pieces of it, all parts and pieces of it. And, you know, getting, oh, all, I mean, getting guests too, right? So it takes some time to establish yourself in the marketplace to get new guests that are interesting and that are going to contribute positive vibes to the community. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much I answered your question, but. You did phenomenal, Danko. All right. Good. So here's the thing. You said something. I want to do a little bit of a deeper dive on this, right? You went through a process that I've heard people explain. I kind of characterize it as beta testing, yes. right? where you have to beta test your ideal. You have to literally put it to the test, acquire feedback, eat the criticism like Skittles, make the adjustments, right? Do the things you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not easy. You know, you have to have thick skin. Right. Um, you have to have a really strong why. I don't want to take words out of your mouth, but I think you kind of know where I'm going with this, right? Usually one of the primary reasons why entrepreneurs fail, especially in the beginning, is they're so concerned about everyone's opinion. Family, friends, people around them. And the opinions of the people around them become bigger than the reason for starting a business in the first place. And that's fatal, right? That's the kiss of death. I think that's the reason why most entrepreneurs fail in the beginning. Right. And I know you received some pushback, but you weren't, you weren't deterred. They could do a little bit deeper dive. Why? What allowed yeah. you to kind of persevere through that period? That's a good question. And I think most entrepreneurs will let everyone else around them control their direction, right? Mm -hmm. And by, interestingly enough, here we are today using words, right? that are driving our thought process and every word that is exchanged leads to new words, new combinations, right? And if we allow negative words and people to affect us daily, and those negative words are more in our life than positive words, your project probably will not make it unless you have the strength to take those words out of your out of your world or discount them and start focusing on your clear words and i and i believe it takes some meditation i believe it takes some clarity to know who you are and that's not so easy because media wants to tell us who we are they want to create fear in that you need to stick to what everyone else is doing, right? And no great change has happened by doing the same thing. And so 
if you're an entrepreneur and you're getting pushback from your family, your friends, and it's sometimes not even pushback, it's almost like just laughter or why are you doing something like that, right? And that's the, that's the part where if your mission is strong enough, you won't, I don't think, veer from it, right? If you don't take the time to invest in your true goals, it'll be easier to abandon your mission. And uh, I feel many times people are just going after something that's going to make money only. And usually that leads to, I'm not sure of the results, but it doesn't make the individual all that uh, fulfilled if there's not some kind of passion or interest connected to it. Does that answer that? You're crushing it, Danko. You're crushing all right. it. All right. All right. Good. Uh, I do want to ask with, with as strong as your mission is, and it's very focused and it's very clear, and because of the work that you do, um, it's mostly digital anyway. Have you had to pivot um, or adjust based on COVID at all or um, the pandemic or have has it mostly remained the same? Have conversations shifted? Has, your, has part of that mission evolved a little bit? Um, I'm just curious. That's a great question. I appreciate it because what COVID did for us was our product was ahead of COVID. We, this product was launched, this particular mobile magazine was launched in 2018, which people were like, you know, we don't do that here in America. We don't scan stuff. And right. you know, maybe in China, you could right. get people to scan it. And then uh, we stayed focused on it because I believe this was the most efficient way to directly guide people to this media. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when COVID hit, everything shut down, right? So nobody could move. March came. We couldn't do what we were doing. And so, yeah, we had to pivot. Our radio, our radio broadcast, uh, we were broadcasting out of 88.1 FM in, uh, in Highland Park. They contracted. There was COVID cases live there. So we couldn't broadcast out of there. Uh, they were offering some Zoom meetings and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it made me step back for a minute and say, where do we go now? And then it, then it looked like it was getting worse yeah. with other social conflicts in our city and other businesses closed down. And now we've got this and now we've got that and now this. And so you do have to take a step back. And I'm going to just show you really quickly. Sorry about that. Uh, I wanted to show you um, what our product looks like, right? Mm -hmm. And and really, we're an excellent solution as COVID comes up mm -hmm. and for the environment. So one mag is a, our patented product, and it gives you access to over 200 mobile um, uh, mobile magazines, right? So if you're in a waiting area at an auto dealer or at your di dentist office, doctor's office, beauty salon, wherever you may wait, the airport, we want to have one mag there so that you can just scan it better for the environment and quicker access to information. Mm -hmm. So this product, along with our local product, became a, a great viable thing as we started to enter the marketplace. So in Detroit, everything was stagnant, but I got a call from a friend in Ann Arbor and he said, you know, I really have been giving a lot of thought to your product and what you're up to in Detroit. And I'd like to do that in Ann Arbor with you. And so we created the Ann Arbor product in the last, uh, during the COVID times, actually. Mm -hmm. So 
we were able to start to test the market there. It's a much smaller market. And we were able to refine our business model in that market. And we were able to use a lot of the resources that we had in Detroit. So we were sitting there supporting the Ann Arbor market, refining our model. And now with coming out of COVID, we're getting so much acceptance of the product, people want it. And a year ago, somebody might have said, well, that's just dumb. We don't need that, right? Mm -hmm. And and we got a lot of that. They're like, well, why would we want that? We've got magazines and we've got this and we've got that. And our belief was that we our system was more efficient. Yeah. And we weren't going to be controlled by our um, what others felt because there's always going to be competition, right? You have to have that belief and verify that belief and continue. Does that answer? Yes, no, absolutely. Right. <laughs> I, it's always exciting to hear um, about the work people have accomplished during this pandemic. You know, it's, we hear, we're very inundated with um, the, the pitfalls of everything that's happened and, though, and, and they're not to be dismissed by any means, but it's also always really nice to hear of like, you know, the productivity that's happening and the evolution that's happening and the, you know, uh, things like what you had and you were able to refine that propel us moving. Yeah, we, um, we, right, we were all sitting in our house in March going, what the, right? And then we can't go anywhere, we can't do anything, the world's gonna end. Yeah. And, uh, and then after that, maybe, you know, a month or two of that, and I'm like, forget this, I have to live. We have to continue, we have to figure out what we're gonna do, how we're gonna go forward. And there's risk, life is risk. You know, so it was unfortunate how bad Detroit got hit so early, but actually better because it kind of cleared the mess out of Detroit a little bit as far as COVID's concerned. And now it's in other places. So I feel like a little more comfortable about doing business um, because we were able to like kind of go over that hump in this city. Yeah. But at the same time, I feel like a lot of people even still are living in fear. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think as, as people, we have to get more realistic on like, okay, there's always going to be something. Be safe, be cautious, but you can't break down and collapse. And that's what I think this show is about, right? Is to try to help entrepreneurs understand that and business owners and people that we want to, we got to keep living and you got to keep thinking and keep pushing and keep working at what you believe in. Yeah. And Detroit's so resilient. You know, we are so badass that I think, you know, we know where we're going. We will get there. And yeah, we had a couple bumps here and there's been a lot of BS that's come down the pipes from media. Um, creating that fear and creating that, um, the, the divide, right? There's that we, our company very united stands true to that mission of, we want to keep the intentions best for everyone in the community, not just some. So I believe media does that today. They're obviously helping some, more than others. And they're not looking for the best intentions of all. And all of a sudden, you know, they media is funny because when we got really local, then they're like, well, we're we're really Detroit too. And I'm like, where have you been covering these topics for the last five years or two years or three years or one year? Now all of a sudden you find somebody that you feel like you should start interviewing real Detroiters? I mean, it was like, it's been ridiculous. <laughs> Have you seen that too, Juan? It's like all of a sudden now, well, yeah, uh, we, you know, you know people I, can't, read that. Huh? I can't help but chuckle um, because you're saying all the things I'm thinking. I don't even have to ask any questions. 
<laughs> right? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even having to ask. No, no questions that's here. You're saying exactly uh, what's been coming out of my mouth in terms of resiliency, in terms of entrepreneurial spirit, right? Um, we live life out on the edges. You know, yes. we see things first. Uh, right. We're willing to take the risk um, that other people won't take, deal with the right. consequences that other people won't deal with. Um, and oftentimes there's some pain, but there's okay. also some, there's also a lot of reward, right? And I'm just a firm believer that if you are solving people's needs, if you are really meeting the needs of people, sooner or later, that damn's going to break in your favor, right? And you spoke very eloquently to that. I love it. Um, and look, you know, we don't want to turn this into a political talk show, right? No, no. <laughs> but well, because you're going to encounter know, things everywhere, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but we know that everyday folk aren't receiving the attention they deserve, right? right? Um, there are certain segments of our society that receive more airplay, more attention. Uh, right. Somehow their opinions matter more. And we know there are, are huge settings right. of society that their stories aren't being told. So um, I think that's one of the greatest values in terms of what you provide here in the community. Um, Thank you, Juan. It's an honor. It's really an honor to be able to do that to me. Mm -hmm. It's not out of, um, because it's not out of profit. Mm. It's an honor to be able to broadcast, in my opinion, to be on the airwaves, to talk to such great people. It's an honor. It's been an honor. So, man, we covered a lot <laughs> at a very short amount of time. Um, there are some other questions I want to get to, but, I mean, it doesn't hurt us that we didn't cover it. Um, so, I guess... One of the things, I have two questions, right? The first being is you take, and we had the discussion before we began, right? But let's revisit it. When you take inventory in terms of what's going on with the community now, what do you feel are some of the biggest needs that need to be, that, that need to be met, right? Where are the deficits? Where are the weaknesses in the system, so to speak, where people just need to be served better? Boy, it's, it's, uh, there's so many spots, right? I mean, transportation, I feel, has been a huge downfall of Detroit. Mm. We have really poor transportation. That means, like, if, I wanna, if, if I'm on one side of town and I need to go to the hospital, how am I going to get there, right? Or if I, so that's community health, right? It's interconnected with transportation. And also, what are the resources out there that I can access and get assistance in, be it um, my neighborhood, there's issues uh, with um, the resources that I have in my neighborhood. Like, how quickly can I um, make a change request or talk about that issue? So there's a lot of places, I believe, that, but it comes back to efficiency on how people can interconnect with others is how we're gonna grow. Like a lot of times people are, are counting on the city, right? Well, the city's not doing this and these guys aren't doing that. But if we as a community step back, I feel like, and understand what our people in our community are going through, right? You can uh, help through the different churches and interconnect, but we also have to take an inventory of stock of like, what do we've got, what do we have in each community? Because each community in Detroit is different, right? You've got pockets of this, pockets of that, and each one has their own need. Um, and we, on a, bigger, on a bigger scale though, number one is I think transport to, interconnect our city properly so that people can move and create economies. Uh, our food situation in our city, it needs to be better and more dispersed where we have fresh food and fresh ways for people to access 
healthy food all around our city. And I know there's some good programs out there that are trying to accomplish that, but there's just not enough fresh food stores throughout the Detroit area. And to me, you know, all right, so we got a Whole Foods downtown, right? In the safest, cushiest spot, right? So I think the people that are gonna take risks are gonna get major rewards, mm -hmm. right? So I wanna see these big fruit guys and uh, vegetable guys come in, Randazzles, I mean, they all went north. How about coming back to the city which built you, mm -hmm. right? And, and spread that love around. So I think food is critical, connecting our people through transport, efficient means of transportation. We need that for our community. Uh, and opening up that voice for our children through education and getting them the tools they need to be successful, right? Like right now, theoretically, if we're all virtually learning, we should be able to uh, learn and engage the same way across the board. But I, we all know that's not gonna occur. So how do we level the playing field there in education? And virtually, how can we transcend to that next point of where we need to be? I mean, I could talk even deeper because I think our public education system is, uh, has a lot of core issues that have created where we are now. That's personal, but I believe our education system needs massive reform. I love it. I love it. So in, in wrapping up, Dan Alexa, I wish this conversation go on for another hour, man. Yeah, I, I could do like, it. I, I could do it. We'll, I just have you, could. we'll just have you back and we'll get All to right. that. Love it. Um, when you Look at the landscape out there, right? Uh, radio broadcast is tough, man. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a tough industry. <laughs> and uh, I applaud your tenacity and courage, and um, the fact that you've utilized it as a medium to uplift the community, right? And and be a catalyst for change. Um, we've seen a lot of people try that medium um, and try to build in that space. What do you feel like's your your competitive advantage is? What's allowed you to build, thrive, pivot, grow, continue to employ that statement to serve the mission, but also, of course, you know, sustain and thrive yourself? What, what's your competitive advantage? What's allowed you to be successful in this space? Well, I got to tell you, I mean, growing up in Hamtramck, I think gave me a huge competitive advantage. You know, I had to fight my way back to school and back. We had wasn't always pretty you know what I mean you had to walk through the alleys you had all kinds of obstacles you had to uh get through just to make it through the day you know what I mean one day it was not easy in Detroit <laughs> so uh that gave me a competitive advantage just like right now what we're, we're it's hard it's tough but it's going to give us a competitive advantage and when you are put into positions that you need to figure out how to get through will give you a competitive advantage. And um, I guess that's really where it starts, right? My background as a, uh, an immigrant to this country, uh, watching my family uh, work in the auto factories and struggle to make it to the next month, week, year, as things changed in Detroit, layoffs and the economy changed, and there was ups and downs all the way through. And uh, being able to be resilient and frugal, right? I mean, growing up in Detroit, you've got to like you got to save your pennies and be smart on how you use them because tomorrow there might not be any pennies. So you got to really be smart. So. Growing up as a Detroiter, man, that really gave me the competitive advantage. That's all I really want to say. I think there's no other thing that really gave me something that I don't think I could have gotten anywhere else. Yeah. Because had I grown up in the suburbs and done all that, there's nothing really to fight for. Everything's kind of all okay, right? And when you look at challenges that we face, 
uh, today and in the future, we're going to be faced with all these types of challenges on who says what, what's, what's true, what's not true. And over the years, I think my, my, that understanding of different languages, different cultures has given me that competitive advantage to understand people a little bit deeper and ask some questions that others may not. And um, having grown up in such a diverse community, you know, my, I was friends with everyone. So that transcended into where I am today. And I feel comfortable with every sort of person. Unfortunately, if you grow up in all whatever neighborhood, you're not going to feel that way. So our show is about inclus uh, inclusivity, diver uh, diversity, and that's, I guess, who we are. We're very united. And I feel like that's what we need to continue to do, is unite, 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 and continue uniting, and don't let people try to divide us. Togetherness. I love it. <laughs> So, thank you once again. Uh, sure. I feel like I'm at a prep rally today. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So, we, we try to wrap these um, interviews up with um, some, some, a little bit of brevity, if you will, you know, lightheartedness, a little bit of fun. Jacob, what um, do you believe your superpower is or... What do you believe your spirit animal is? Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't know why. Uh, let's just say I think my spirit animal is the falcon. I don't know why, but they just seem cool, and they'll land on your arm. So <laughs> they can get things done with the falcon. And then my superpower is... Uh, I think uh, I think getting people closer to their true self. Mm. That's maybe not a superpower like no, Spider Man, but you know <laughs> we like to ask the questions that make people get closer to who they are. Excellent, love it. That's excellent. Yes, indeed. Great show. You know, thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, one very important lesson, something that you believe entrepreneurs either misconstrue or misunderstand, or what's one important nugget you want to leave um, entrepreneurs with before we sign off here in terms of what's required to be successful? Um, you know, what advice you give individuals, particularly who are starting businesses during this period right now? Right. Firstly, firstly, um, entrepreneurs and people that are starting businesses need to understand no one owes you anything, right? A lot of entrepreneurs feel like, oh, this guy owes me or this, you know, or that. No. And when you start a business, you know that no one owes you anything because, mm -hmm. right? You need to prove what you have is something they want and they're willing to pay for it. And you need to create that value. And that value doesn't just happen by you saying something or making a nice mark. It's who your brand is, right? And that's why it's so important on the brand and our focus of who we are as a brand, right? And I would, I would recommend this to entrepreneurs to say, really look at what is your brand? What do you stand for? Everyone's so different that they need to understand their brand and how they can incorporate that into their business. And to remember that showing the value is critical and that no one owes you anything. So don't expect purchases or sales because of, well, that's my uncle or that's my cousin or whatever. You need to create your value prop, right? And present that to the market. Couldn't have said it better myself, Danko. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Yes. 
Thank you, Dinko. We appreciate you being here. We, there were a slew of other questions that we didn't get to that we'll definitely have to have you back um, to do that. Um, let our audience know what is the best way to get in contact with you, to get involved with Very United and Very Detroit. What's the easiest way for them to do that? Uh, easiest way is to, uh, you can go to facebook.com forward slash Very Detroit. We also have uh, Instagram Very Detroit. We have, um, but you can get a hold of us by 313 uh, 312-4359 is our mobile number. Um, you can also get to us through email, verydetroit at gmail.com. And we're always looking for people that want to join us in, in helping others share their message. So if there's folks out there that know people or want to help out or are in part of a different city that want to start something like this, let me know. We'd love to help you. Excellent. Thank you again. Thank you everyone who's watching. Um, again, if you haven't subscribed, make sure you do. If you want to learn more about Next Op Social, you can visit nextopsocial.com. We encourage you to do that. Um, and otherwise, we will talk to you all soon.